Hello everybody, my name is Bradley and this is Sums Up, a channel on how to survive in the online jungle. Today we're going to be talking about a very important aspect of cybersecurity, cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. Now, it's commonly believed that Bitcoin and other kinds of cryptocurrency are anonymous and therefore they can be used to pay for illegal endeavours on the darknet, right? Hiring hackers, buying illegal goods or laundering money. But you'd be surprised to find out that they aren't all that anonymous after all. Roger Stevens. So Bitcoin itself is rather like a bulletproof glass safe. Of course, it's difficult to steal valuables from it, but everybody around it can see what's inside. Now, I doubt you'd agree to walk around in a t-shirt with your bank statement on it, right? Or publish your family budget in the morning newspaper. So look, let's figure out together how to avoid the trap of pseudonymity in the confusing world of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. So to understand why Bitcoin itself is vulnerable, you first need to understand how it works. And that's really where this problem comes in. Very often, expert explanations regarding the algorithms of these complex programs can become, well, boring lectures. To understand them, you have to be familiar with all sorts of mathematical analyses. You have to deal with a huge number of terms and just frankly, scary words. Surely you've come across this before. I mean, explanations that hinder your understanding as opposed to helping it. Therefore, today, I'm going to try and tell you about cryptocurrencies and the blockchain as simply as possible. Now, if you're an expert on Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Chia, this may not be the place for you, but you can safely move on to the next chapter. So let's imagine that our good friend, upside down friend, Lucas, right, decides to try his hand in the financial business. He takes 100,000 US dollars from the bank and invests it in various businesses of his friends. Now, let's say Lucas has a bad memory and he doesn't trust computers, so he keeps all of his investment records on a good old-fashioned notepad. Now, his entries will look something like this. Took a bank loan, right, plus 100,000. Invested in a car rental company, minus 30,000. Invested in Bradley's translation agency, minus 10,000. And invested in a travel agency, 20,000. So everything is pretty simple and clear, as if it were a family budget. But now imagine that I got my hands on this notebook. Well, with just one swift swipe of my secret eraser, I no longer owe Lucas $10,000 for his investment into my translation company. I just hacked into Lucas's payment system. So is it possible to protect yourself from such tricks? You could add a control code to each record. For example, count the number of characters in each line and write down a total at the end of the line. See, took a bank loan, 27. Invested in a car rental company, 42. Invested in Bradley's translation agency, 50. Invested in a travel agency, 37. So now it's much more difficult to change the record. If I were to just erase a zero from my debt, Lucas would see that the number of characters in the line doesn't match the control value for the line. Now that would be a clear sign of forgery, but surely I could just erase the whole line, right? Both the amount of the debt and the checksum, and then Lucas would be none the wiser. Well, the countermeasure to this is quite simple. Make sure that each line is connected to one another. You can do this by adding the number of characters from the line before to the number of characters of the line in question. Now what you get is a combined total, which will feature at the end of the line itself. Took a bank loan, 27. Invested in a car rental company, 69. Invested in Bradley's translation agency, 92. Invested in a travel agency, 87. You see, now the checksum protects not only its own data, but also that of the previous row. Now, if I were to erase the entire row, Lucas would notice that there's missing data. Now, here's something else. Lucas also likes round sums. He wants all of these control numbers to end with zero. Therefore, he decides to add additional characters to the line to make sure there are no ugly entries, right? Now, let's look what we've got. Took a bank loan, 30. Invested in a car rental company, 70. Invested in Bradley's translation agency, 100. Invested in a travel agency, 90. Now, in a nutshell, that's kind of how Bitcoin works. Of course, it doesn't count characters, but it does use a special mathematical function that is easy to calculate in one direction and difficult to calculate in the other. It's a bit like squaring the number, I don't know, 23. It's pretty easy, right? You just need to multiply it by itself, but it's much more difficult to move in the opposite direction, or in our case, find the root for 529. One-way transformations are called hash functions, and they fittingly result in hashes. And of course, since the control function relies on its complexity, it's rather difficult to make it beautiful. 
Additional characters that allow the hash to end with a pair of zeros are called cryptographic nonces, numbers that can be used only once. With Bitcoin, several users are searching for these nonces at any one time. It's almost like a lock-picking race, right? Now, whoever calculates the nonce first gets rewarded. Now, this lock-picking race is called Bitcoin mining, which I'm sure you've heard of. Now, each record of money movement in Lucas's notebook is a transaction, and together with the calculated control values, it becomes a block, right? So the sequence or chain of such blocks is called the blockchain, fittingly. You see, it's not really that complicated after all. This algorithm was actually first described in 1998 in the works of Wei Dai and Nick Sabo. Now, independently of one another, they came up with the ideas of B-Money and BitGold. Cryptocurrencies as we know them, however, appeared only 10 years later. Now, on January the 9th of 2009, a man who is still hiding under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto published the very first version of this system. By implementing anonymity, he had hoped that this service would enable people to set up electronic wallets, but without having to give out their personal details. The potential for unpunished transferring of legal funds didn't really occurred to him at that point. The idea was that cryptographic information would really replace your real data. All records of money transfers remain in the system forever. They're stored on computers of millions of people around the world, and it's actually mathematically impossible to remove even an individual block of this chain. But it is possible to trace the transfers from wallet to wallet. The amount of data here is incomprehensibly huge, right? But it is open to analysis. On the web, you can even find online block analyzers, for example, on blockstream.info. From this data set, if the analyst's time and abilities allow for it, lots of interesting information can be squeezed out. Firstly, there are inputs, right? The sources of digital money, the wallets from which the cryptocurrency is sent. Now, secondly, there are outputs. Now, these are the recipient wallets, right? To which the cryptocurrency is sent. And finally, the exact times of these transactions are also displayed. Now, of course, this isn't exactly a link to your Facebook page, but it's certainly a step towards it. So look, let's say I returned that debt to Lucas, but I did it in Bitcoin. Now, he'll see my transaction input. That is the source of funds relating to my transaction. But I will be able to see his outputs. That is when and to whom he will send that currency. Is that anonymity? I mean, what if instead of to Lucas's wallet, I sent that payment to a fake NSA or FBI address? Right, we call each other Kenny, okay, Gaddy? All right, Kenny. I don't know if you guys have heard about the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. It happened earlier this year. Now, the specialists of the Ministry of Justice have already retrieved 63 of the 75 bitcoins that that company paid to extortionists. Both inputs and outputs can be highlighted and subsequently de-anonymized. Such lists are actually meticulously maintained by analytics companies and they're often leaked into public access. You can actually gain access to these lists via the darknet using Bitcoin, but you can probably guess why you shouldn't do that. I mean, because of these features, Bitcoin is often referred to as a glass safe. Records of transactions are almost impossible to fake, but you can examine the contents of your wallet in detail, making a schedule of income and expenses, right? Yes. Anonymity? Forget it. Analysts also use something called data clustering. This is where they analyze all of the data on inputs and outputs, they build chains, and they also combine similar transactions. Here too, there's something that I've talked to you about more than once, right? And that is that the more actions you perform, the more traces of you are left. Now, the more traces of you there are, the easier it is for people to distinguish you from other users of the system. Your transactions effectively leave a digital footprint in the same way that a set of fonts might or browser plugins, right? Now, transactions are made up of a variety of factors. We've got inputs and outputs. We've got analyses of the connections between specific addresses inside the chain. We've got comparisons of sums and also time intervals of transactions. The enormous computational costs of searching for similar operations are justified by the fact that the denormization of just one address leads by default to the denormization of all interacting parties. And therefore, real attackers never use the same wallet for different tasks. And for important things in general, wallets are actually created just 
for one-time use. To add to this, there are mixer services. Now, these are services that allow one to confuse their digital footprint by mixing Bitcoins between subscribers of a certain service according to a random algorithm. Payments are split up, combined, transferred many times through fake outputs, and as a result, it becomes much more difficult to unravel this trail. There are also some software tricks that come into play. For example, the manual selection of inputs for specific transactions, a software ban on duplicate addresses, and so on. But all of these methods are useless if we consider Bitcoin as an autonomous system. We don't actually pay attention to web security in general. But it's important to note, most Bitcoin transactions can be tracked easily without these tricks. I mean, the vulnerability is in how you spend your cryptocurrency. For example, when you pay for something in real life, let's say a pizza with Bitcoin, more often than not, you're sending money to an organization that knows you outside of the blockchain. Because of this, if you're trying to pay for something like a pizza using crypto, let's say using money that you've gathered illegally, then it really wouldn't be difficult to link you to an illicit transaction on the blockchain, right? Anonymity and online shopping really don't go hand in hand. In addition, Bitcoin transactions are most often transmitted in encrypted packets, right, over the regular internet. This means that your real IP address is relatively easy to determine. I will find you. And I will hack you. Now, the same problem appears with payments via blockchain or Coinbase wallets. And in this case, companies that process such transactions have detailed logs with IP addresses and other information that just gives you away. And don't forget about the logs that your internet provider keeps, right? Linking cryptographic activity with your identity is really trivial. But look, before you go praying to Hura Mazda for complete blockchain anonymity, it's important to remember that de-anonymizing transfers can be beneficial, not just for the police, but for you too. There's actually a really cool startup that I learned about. It's called whalemap.io. Now they use on-chain analytics to understand who is holding vast amounts of Bitcoin and where that Bitcoin is being sent. Now this information is very useful to investment banks, but also people like you and I, who'd like to make a pound or two off the intensely thought out actions of real players on the cryptocurrency market. What should you do if you do want to keep your payments anonymous? Firstly, you can use more secure cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin really hasn't made any steps in the past few years to become more private, but there are means of payment that were initially designed for maximum secrecy. For example, Zcash reliably protects all of your payment details. Old timers of the dark web can probably recall another system known under three names, actually Darkcoin, Xcoin, and Dash, right? Now, its principle is similar to Mixers. Each transaction is mixed up up to eight times with transactions of other cryptocurrency users. Unfortunately, law enforcement agencies pay special attention to transactions with such payment systems, as you can imagine. So unwittingly, you can get completely unnecessary interest in your activities just because you've chosen to use a service for its anonymity. And lastly, if you do decide to use Bitcoin, don't forget to take a look at our videos on anonymity and the stupid mistakes of hackers. You'll really enjoy them. I mean, it's always better to learn from the mistakes of others, right? Not that you guys are hacking or doing anything shady, right? Anyway, look. I can only wish you good luck in your legitimate endeavors, right? My name is Bradley Peak, and this has been a bright, bountiful, vociferous Bradventure into the world of the online jungle. I will see you in the next video. By the way, guys, the next video will be something that I hope will be incredibly interesting. I don't know if you remember, but about a month ago, I posted an invitation to action where you guys could comment if you wanted us to find out interesting information about you. Well, we've actually now selected the candidates and we are currently investigating them as we speak. So hopefully the next video is going to be really cool. So tune in and maybe you'll see yourself and your Facebook profile on screen. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bradley, and this is some sub's Bitcoin mixing blending show. <laughs> now, Bitcoin is fancy and all, but the real question is, will it blend? <laughs> <laughs>